One of the reasons I'm proud to be an historian is that Churchill was one. History was a constant echo for him. It gave him endless signposts. In the startup community, there is a cult of Napoleon that, that is solely Is emerging. there? I didn't know that. Seriously, is there? Your biography is the part of the canon here. <laughs> if MacArthur had used nuclear weapons against the Chinese crossing the Yalu River, then yes, he might well have actually won that war, but it would have lowered the, the, the moral barrier so significantly that nuclear weapons would have been used an awful lot more. In the future, war will be fought between two sets of drones, and the humans won't be in the loop because decision-making has to take place far, far faster than the human mind can work. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Andrew Roberts, who is most recently the author of Conflict, The Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine. And um, this book is like Churchill's uh, histories of the Second World War, or the First World War, in that one of the principal actors in the conflicts discussed here is the co-author, General David Petraeus, who commanded the uh, U U.S. forces in Afghanistan and Iraq as one of your co-authors. And speaking of Churchill, uh, Andrew is also the author of some superb and uh, magnificent biographies of Churchill, Napoleon, King George, and an excellent book about World War II. But first, let's begin with conflict. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Duarkesh. It's an uh, honor to be on your show. So my first question is this. When we look at the first half of the 20th century, it seems like we got unlucky many times in a row. You, you know, World War I, World War II, the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, the Maoist Revolution in China, all those things um, seem like they didn't have to happen from reading historians about those topics, that if you reversed a bunch of contingent factors a few years back, they, any one of them could have not happened. And in each of those cases, tens of millions of people died. When we look at the second half of the 20th century, which you write about in these books, it seems like we got lucky again and again, right? So the Cuban Missile Crisis doesn't go nuclear. We have all these proxy wars that don't go nuclear or result in a world war. China and India liberalize. Communism falls. What explains why we had such different luck in these two different parts of the century? Um, the invention of the nuclear bomb. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much as easy as that. You have all of these wars take place in the post-nuclear age after 1945. And... So as a result, you have an umbrella under which everybody acts. But although there are hundreds of wars that break out, about 140 wars, they have to be fought in an essentially limited way because of the uh, existence of nuclear weapons. But couldn't you have said the same thing before World War I? And in fact, many did say that about, before World War I, where we have all this heavy artillery, we have these, we kill millions of people even then, and they still went to war. So how, how much does nuclear war explain the, the, the absence of something escalating? Well, you're right that the First World War did come about um, in part because of the, um, the arms race. But um, the knowledge that the nuclear bomb could obliterate the entire planet is something that has uh, always managed to make wars limited post-1945. What happened in 1914, the most people you could kill in a single moment would be as the result of, a, uh, of an artillery shell. And um, that's nothing like a nuclear bomb, frankly. So it's, uh, it's, it's apples and pears, I think. It's really interesting in this book, you write about all these conflicts that have happened since World War II. And in many cases, they're counterinsurgencies or civil wars. And it's interesting when one side gets to say that they're the legitimate force uh, fighting for the country's independence against foreign aggressors, when both sides are getting foreign funding and support. You know, uh, So I I'm curious how come the US has been bad at the propaganda here, where Ho Chi Minh or the Taliban get to say that they're the legitimate forces fighting for their country? Uh, or how, how does that determination get made? Yes, that's a very good point. It's, uh, I mean, I think in both cases, obviously, Ho Chi Minh and the Taliban both uh, were, were local inhabitants in a way that the United States obviously wasn't in either place. Um, but whether they represented the majority of the people in uh, either North Vietnam or Afghanistan is a completely different issue. So, it's much more a question of whether or not they are totalitarian powers who are able to uh, establish dominance and keep it in a um, in a 
difficult and dangerous part of the world. And that's what both of them were able to do. It didn't mean that they have a uh, legitimacy in the kind of Jeffersonian democracy that one would uh, like in a utopian world. But if they are the people um, that are wielding the power in the sense of a um, Marxist-Leninist clique, of course, uh, in, in North Korea, uh, Vietnam, you have to deal with them, and they are the they are the established government. But it's interesting that South Vietnam or the uh, the the government in Afghanistan didn't seem to have that same sort of legitimacy that that these other uh, insurgencies had, even though they were still local governments. Um, do you think not? I I rather think they do. I I uh, I mean, obviously, they're both immensely um, inefficient and useless and corrupt. But nonetheless, I don't think that that detracts from the fact that they were more legitimate than the, uh, than the forces that were rising up against them. Yeah, and in fact, this might be a good opportunity for you to discuss the four key uh, tenets of strategic leadership that you discuss in the book. Yes, well, what we found in the book very much, very strongly, and it's interesting you should have mentioned the Chinese Civil War because you get that very powerfully as well, is that the side that um, wins wars very often is not the one that controls the cities or has the largest amount of men or um, has the best weaponry. As you mentioned, the Chinese Civil War, let's look at that for a second. It's uh, the Guomindang nationalist uh, forces at the outset of that war had all the major cities. They had four or five times the number of men. And they also had all the advanced weaponry that they'd taken off the Japanese at the time of the Japanese surrender in 1945. Yet they still lost that war. And one of the reasons was that they didn't have very impressive strategic leadership. And um, Chiang Kai-shek, even when he did come up with good um, plans often had warlords below him that refused to carry them out. So what we uh, discovered in war after war is that the thing that matters most is this concept of strategic leadership, by what, which we mean having a leader at the uh, top, either civil or military, um, but the ultimate decision maker. And it's usually best when there's somebody who's represents the civil and somebody who represents the military and they get on and they need to get the big idea for the war right they need to then be able to communicate that um, to their lieutenants effectively and indeed to the wider um, country they need to be able to implement it um, aggressively and uh, and efficiently and then they need as the fourth of the uh, of the um, levels to continue to adapt the uh, big idea to uh, circumstances on the ground and to the way in which the war develops because obviously you know the war no war carries out according to plan um, the enemy always has a say so uh, and then and then to uh, refine it again and again and again and so that is it's a, the people who are able to do that are very often victorious even though they uh, start off the uh, the campaign with um, many more disadvantages than their enemy. You know, I think this might be a good opportunity to start talking about Iraq and Afghanistan, which obviously your co-author can, can speak to like nobody else. I, I found it really interesting in reading his accounts of what happened in those two countries, um, I, especially Iraq, which was uh, a premeditated invasion. It wasn't something we had to just immediately do, right? It would have a completely different casus belli with the weapons of mass destruction than 9-11. Well, and, and, and also the surprise attack on Kuwait, of course. I mean, the, that's the ultimate reason that, uh, that this took place, the, what had happened uh, 13 years before and the, and the 13 years in between. You know, uh, it wasn't just WMD. Yeah, yeah. Although the, the, I guess that's still, 13 years still leaves us enough time to have a plan of what to do. And I found it interesting that, you know, you're discussing that after the coup, uh, the regime has been changed, you realize that there's not a plan for how to ensure security and stability in the country. And I, I just can't imagine. I mean, you have obviously you have really intelligent people like David Petraeus there who are working on this. How is it possible that there was an invasion of these countries without a good plan of how to secure them afterwards. Well, he wasn't working on it. He was working on how to um, destroy the Iraqi army and get to Baghdad. And the people who were working on it were a completely different set of uh, 
of um, generals who were failing to work out what to do once you had got to Baghdad and who assumed that the thing to do would be to get rid of the Ba'ath Party, which essentially ran the country, um, down to the sort of fourth level. It was all very well getting rid of uh, Saddam's sons and, uh, and some of the other people at the top level. But when you do that, and also you uh, essentially send the army home and not tell them how they're going to feed their families, and allow them to keep their weapons. You've got a um, recipe for disaster, and and sure enough, disaster happened. But um, that can't be blamed on the sort of uh, soldiers at the point of the spear, who did an extremely good job, who overthrew that uh, regime in um, in double quick time. Now, speaking of strategic leadership, uh, why is it that we don't have a figure natively in Iraq and Afghanistan who had? that level of leadership themselves, you know, uh, a Zelensky in Iraq and Afghanistan, where in the book, uh, uh, General Petraeus discusses the endless frustrations he had with uh, Malaki in Iraq. And of course, Ghani leaves uh, Afghanistan when the Taliban start routing the Afghani forces. And Karzai, of course, also in Afghanistan. Yeah, these guys come in for a bit of a pasting, understandably, in our book, uh, um, because they are not uh, the sort of Churchillian figures that uh, Zelensky is. Um, I think it partly uh, it's down to the sectarian nature of um, Iraqi and Afghan society, tribal nature of um, of society, where however good a leader is, he doesn't automatically command the um, the uh, attention and um, loyalty of other people in the same country. You know, the thing about Zelensky was that it was very clear very early on that he was speaking for the huge majority of the country. And it's very difficult for an Iraqi or Afghan leader, however good they are. And I'm not saying for one minute that Maliki and um, Karzai were were any good, let alone the last chap who gets into his uh, helicopter weighed down with suitcases full of money and and hightails it out of there. You know, Um, by complete contrast, you do have Zelensky who, uh, who shows all of those four qualities of leadership that I mentioned. And also, of course, who uh, decided he was going to stay in Kyiv, fighting Kyiv. His family were going to stay in Kyiv. He wasn't going to let any um, military age male Ukrainians uh, leave the country. And his big idea was, um, I need ammunition, not a ride. What is our big idea, uh, the Americans' big idea in Ukraine? What is the um, ceasefire or end arrangement we are driving at, which we think would be plausible for both sides to accept? Good question. I, I don't think Biden has uh, has articulated one properly yet. Um, Zelensky has, which is the uh, obvious one, which is that we're not going to allow 18 to 19% of our country to forever be under the rule of the um, Russians, and we're going to throw them out. And when, um, when David and I visited Kyiv about four months ago, we came across a huge um, level of national unity over that big idea. The All the generals, of course, and the uh, ministers could subscribe to it, but they're sort of paid to it as part of their job. But so also did everybody on the street and everybody that we spoke to. Um, they all absolutely believed in um, ultimate victory. They didn't know how that long it was going to take. They didn't know uh, how much more blood was going to have to be shed. But um, they all believed that this would not stand and that they were going to ultimately be victorious, even if you, the uh, Americans, cut off their um, their funding after the next election. Right. But so then but, but what is the answer to the American question of what what is our goal? Is that the same as the Ukrainian goal? I, no, I don't think it is at the moment. It seems to be to wait until other countries, such as Britain, uh, give um, a new set of weaponry, then to give much more of the same kind of weaponry, then to wait until somebody else gives some more advanced weaponry. You saw this with anti-tank weaponry, uh, later with tanks, then with um, artillery, then long-range artillery. Now you've been giving them this uh, attackums. Uh, which are uh, very impressive, but um, you've hung back a bit with um, with fighter aircraft and so on. So it's um, it seems to be a piecemeal approach where you where you wait until the Russians don't respond and then you give a, a bit more. Um, frankly, it would have been much better, I think, to have um, to have armed the Ukrainians earlier with the with the 
you know, leopards, essentially, and the tanks that they really needed for this big uh, southern counteroffensive, and um, and come out wholeheartedly for them. Now, you've given them a lot of money, obviously, 44 billion is a very significant amount of money, and the Europeans have given as much or slightly more now. But still, the Russians are in, in control of 18% of the country, and they've been building what the Ukrainians were expecting, hundreds of yards of minefields. In fact, there are mi- miles of minefields down in the south there. And so I'm afraid it is a, it's a long and bloody slog. But we've seen wars like this before. This is one of the things that uh, we write about, uh, the Korean War being a classic example, where you just have to, um, have to thrash it out. Actually, I want to ask you about Korea in a second, but yeah, this I guess you might have just answered this question right now, but it does seem weird that we're slowly funding a war of attrition. You know, it's classic Clausewitz to focus your effort on the point of attack. If you have, if you're just slowly doling out this equipment, why not just give it to them all at once so they can have a successful counteroffensive? Because I don't think you've got the political will in the United States to do that. Frankly, I think that um, yes, you you have a sort of nominal majority in um, both houses, but especially with your lower house at the moment, what's going on there? You you uh, you don't have the uh, the sense of um, of national will to to do that. And so as a result, these poor um, uh, Ukrainians are you know, fighting and dying. And when you do give them stuff, it's extremely helpful and, and useful. But, uh, but as I say, the, um, the key point is that they will carry on fighting and dying, even if you didn't give them the stuff, because they're not going to have America essentially uh, dictating to them um, what their national destiny is. Now, speaking of the Korean War, the, the the chapter you wrote about this in your book was really interesting and great. And I wonder if Truman had decided to use a nuclear bomb in Korea, had agreed with MacArthur to do so, whether the taboo that we have against nuclear weapons would, against tactical nuclear weapons, would not have emerged in the first place. And so, you know, the Soviets would have used it in Afghanistan, we would have used it in Vietnam. Um, and Thatcher would have used it in the Falklands. Um, <laughs> no, I don't. I, don't. I wouldn't go that far because because that would have wiped out the Falklands, and we were trying to uh, uh, to, to win back the Falklands. But um, yeah, no, you're quite right. Of course, if um, MacArthur had used nuclear weapons against the Chinese crossing the Yalu River then yes, he might well have actually won that war, but it would have lowered the, the, the moral barrier so significantly that nuclear war, nuclear weapons would have been used an awful lot more. As it is today, although there's lots of saber rattling by uh, Lavrov and um, Putin, it doesn't really look as though, I mean, yes, there might be a, um, a catastrophic disaster at Japarizia, nuclear plant, but it's very unlikely for um, Putin actually to use tactical nuclear missiles in Ukraine, not least, of course, because the Chinese don't want him to. But um, but had they been a regular feature of the of warfare in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and so on, then, then uh, yeah, he, he might well do it. I just think it's important to, when you're looking back in history to give credit uh, at, you know, decisions that are not often discussed like this, where we just, Truman just decided to lose Korea rather than, at the time, the taboo didn't even exist, but rather than to create a taboo uh, against nuclear weapons. Exactly. He did He did create it. Um, as did Clement Attlee, actually, to give him his due, the British Prime Minister flew over to Washington, very concerned about this talk, um, tr- tr- um, MacArthur's talk about the um, using the nuclear bomb. Um, and so he needs to get some credit as well. And also, actually, Truman needs credit for sacking MacArthur um, in the first place, because MacArthur did have some, um, I mean, he was a charismatic and impressive figure whose island hopping policy in the Second World War was, was, you know, inspired and so on. But he was the classic example of the general who becomes too powerful, an over mighty subject who um, who had political ambitions himself, who got the um, uh, the Chinese involvement in the war completely wrong, got the big ideas wrong essentially, and had to be um, and had to be sacked. And that, that's also another interesting point: uh, how overwhelmingly popular he was. And I remember reading in um, uh, Lyndon Johnson's biography that when MacArthur came to Congress to speak after he was sacked about the Korean War's progression. Somebody said, you know, this is the closest thing. If he had wanted to, MacArthur was so popular that he could have just said, like, we're going to sack the Capitol and people would have just followed him. 
Um, well, I mean, having seen what I, having having seen what happened on January the sixth um, of, uh, <laughs> of last year, it's obviously not uh, completely impossible. Um, okay, going back to Iraq and Afghanistan, how much have those conflicts, those counterinsurgency operations, prepared the American military for a war with a peer competitor like China? Um, a great deal, obviously, um, but that's that's true of most wars. It's interesting, of course, China hasn't actually fought a major um, war for a very long time, really, and um, since the 1960s against India. So actual practice is an incredibly useful thing. If Ukraine were ever to be allowed into NATO, for example, we'd have 900,000 um, troops on the southern border of, um, of NATO. It would be a uh, huge addition. So actually having troops that have fought um, is a... Uh, it's there's no amount of training that is the same as uh, as actual war fighting. Um, what you mentioned earlier, actually, I was just thinking about um, that that good question you asked about um, nuclear bombs. Of course, what we're seeing today in Gaza is a, a classic example of limited war. In that, um, however vicious and ghastly and and painful and bloody it's going to be, um, it is the story of a um, of a group fighting against the country which has got the nuclear bomb alone of all the countries in the uh, region and um, is uh, on moral grounds not prepared even to threaten the the use of it. Um, so in that sense, um, the Netanyahu government has uh, a, it, it's not doing what Lavrov and um, Putin are doing by, by saber rattling the, um, the nuclear option, which does exist, you know, I mean, so much of what is happening is as a result of um, Tehran uh, wanting it to happen. And uh, Tehran doesn't have the bomb and Israel does. And yet Israel is not threatening um, Tehran. Yeah, and, and that's a really interesting point. I mean, as early as like 1973, you could have had uh, Israel, uh, you know, nuke the Egyptian beachheads. Uh, and it was a war of self-defense. It was like, you know, you, you either you die if you don't use it or you, if you lose the war. Exactly. 73 was an existential war in the way that this one at the moment isn't. Now, obviously, we don't know what's going to happen within Israel, with the West Bank, with Hezbollah, uh, with the Iranians and uh, Syrians. It's not impossible that this could turn into a existential war for, um, for Israel. But, um, but the possession of the nuclear bomb hasn't, you know, done... Israel any favors equally it hasn't weakened it Israel either is uh, is deterrence dead so speaking of Israel you know Iran funded these Hamas terrorists to conduct this attack and as far as I know there's no serious repercussions on Iran itself for doing this or funding Hezbollah of course is deterrence as a doctrine is, is that dead no, because um, it, it's working very well in Southeast Asia, in uh, Taiwan. Um, it is only dead amongst people who are so irrational and illogical that they don't, uh, they don't um, mind essentially being extirpated in the way that uh, the Israelis might soon be trying to extirpate Hamas. So if you if you sort of don't care, if you believe that um, God has, has given you the uh, right and duty to kill Jews, then you're not going to be deterred in the same way that a much more rational and logical um, actor such as Xi Jinping um, is, where he wakes up every morning and thinks, right, should I be invading um, uh, Taiwan? And he recognizes, looks to the world situation, to the might of America um, in the South China Seas and looks to all his neighbors, all but North Korea of which hate and fear him, and um, recognizes that today's not the day to do it. And that is that is what d deterrence is. It's incredibly expensive, of course, deterrence, but it's immensely cheap at the same time compared to the alternative, which is war. So yeah, this is one of the points you make in the book is that deterrence, money spent on deterrence is seldom wasted, but deterrence also has to be credible. Now, regardless, uh, separate from the question of whether America would actually intervene if China invaded Taiwan, is it rational for the Chinese to believe that America would in, uh, intervene on behalf of an island with 20 million people, have a kinetic war with China over an island up the coast of China? 
Does, does that make sense? Like, is that deterrence credible for Chinese? It is. It certainly is, because um, there is what's been called strategic ambiguity in the American stance. And that is something that no rational actor wants to have to deal with. Um, a uh, An America which could be sucked into a major war, an America that could, that would have a, um, maybe act irrationally um, over over uh, Taiwan, or which one, which, um, as you can see with the AUKUS uh, treaty, has got um, ambitions to stand up to China, um, and feels that it needs to carry them out. The public um, statements are obviously not intended deliberately to provoke China, but they're they're pretty um, straightforward in um, in being ambiguous enough that China doesn't want to take the risk, whilst. Obviously, um, the United States uh, military budget is so enormous, so vast, um, it's, it's capable of, of um, deterring China. If it was to, uh, to send the wrong messages, taking ships away and so on, then um, it, uh, it might not. Look at what America's done in Ukraine. And um, Xi recognizes that it's led a coalition which has um, has fought very hard and so far hasn't lost. And so uh, without a single American serviceman being involved, were American servicemen involved, which they would be in a uh, Taiwan confrontation, the um, American president would be much, much more likely to uh, go all in. Yeah, although for, for, if, for example, China blockades Taiwan and puts the onus on America to launch the kinetic war to break through the blockade, I, I wonder if then put in those terms, an American president would not intervene and or at least the Chinese wouldn't expect an American president to launch the kinetic war to break the blockade. Well, they've obviously um, war gamed this a million times in the uh, Pentagon. And um, and I think that um, your, your remark about uh, 20 million people is obviously an apposite one. But do let's also remember that um, Taiwan has 80% of the um, a semiconductor industry, or at least the high-level semiconductor industry, there were lots of good things are being done to uh, mitigate that uh, against that now. But nonetheless, it would be catastrophic for um, China to be able to snaffle all of that in a uh, single coup de main. And um, obviously, uh, the Biden administration knows that. Before we return to conflict, I do want to ask you some questions about um, uh, Churchill and World War II. And in, in fact, uh, this is actually a good jumping off point because, you know, speaking of rational leaders, I, I'm struck when reading your biography of Churchill of uh, how much of his thinking is more emotive, le less probabilistic, much more principled. And w when I try to backtest how I would have reacted, given my mindset to World War II, if I was in Britain, I have to admit, I like to think in terms of probabilities and expected value. I would have said, you know, what's the expected value of uh, fighting Germany in 1938 over Czechoslovakia? What's the, uh, what would happen if he just didn't? It uh, looks like probably, uh, it probably might just be best to uh, run our odds with appeasement. And I wonder if this is just a one-off case, or do you think in general that illustrates a weakness in the more uh, sort of probabilistic way of thinking about geopolitics compared to Churchill's more emotional, oratorial, principled way? I don't really agree with you. I think with the, with the premise, because I think that Churchill, yes, he was emotional and uh, and principled, but also he recognised that the advance that the Germans um, uh, made between the uh, Sudeten crisis, uh, which ended in Munich in uh, September 1938, and the outbreak of war a year later in September 1939, was so huge, especially in uh, in their creation of um, of bombers and uh, and tanks and and uh, so on, um, and also it was helped so much by taking the Skoda factories of the Czechs. Um, from Czechoslovakia and churning out uh, tanks for Germany, that it was a rational thing to have tried to have stopped Germany um, invading Czechoslovakia. So w what Churchill was doing, yes, he was emotional and, and, and a great rhetorician and so on, but he was also making a very, very hard-nosed decision uh, with regard to balance of power, recognizing that in fact Germany was in a much stronger position a year later than it had been at the time of Munich. 
Now, uh, it, it's remarkable to what extent Churchill had read, and not only read, but written a tremendous amount of history. And I'm curious how concretely that history informed his decision making as a leader. Was it at the level of tactics and geography where you see how old battles in the same places are fought? Was it a level of grand strategy? Was it at the understanding of human nature? What level did that understanding of history help him? All of those and more. All of those and more. I One of the reasons I'm proud to be a historian is that Churchill was one. And he used <laughs> his, he used, uh, he was, I mean, primarily that was his job, you know, in the uh, in the 1930s when he was out of office, was to write history books. And uh, the one of his great ancestor, um, John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough, is a um, is it's almost like an autobiography of the Second World War, and he's actually writing about his own ancestor um, two hundred years beforehand. But it is extraordinary how many things to do with um, with tactics and uh, and strategy, of course, but also with how to deal with allies and how to deal with domestic political opinion and so on. All of these um, things are gone into, and then only five years after the. Um, publication of that book, he is prime minister and fighting a world war himself. History was a constant um, echo for him. It gave him endless signposts. It's mentioned in some 10% of his speeches in the Second World War. He, he uh, 10% of those speeches do have um, references to history. He was basically telling the British people that uh, look back at the Spanish Armada, look back at uh, Napoleonic Wars. We have been in this dangerous situation before. The country has seen great perils before Elizabeth I and the Spanish Armada, for example. And um, and we've come through them and been victorious. So yes, he, he recognized the sort of political power of um, historical analogy. And uh, and he bent it to his to his overall overarching theme that we have to stand up to the Nazis. I, actually, so speaking of this, think if if we think of Churchill as an applied historian, um, this isn't a question I was just planning on asking you. But you know, you are in the House of Lords. You've written about these. Uh, I guess all, basically everything that's happened in the last few centuries across your twenty books. Um, <laughs> or would you ever consider getting more involved with politics? Well, I'm a politician. I mean, I, I go to the House of Lords from Monday uh, to Wednesday, lunchtime to dinner part, uh, dinner time. I um, go and uh, vote in the divisions, you know. And uh, no, I mean, other than, other than, I can't see how much more involved in politics I can be than speaking and voting in, in one of the parliaments of our, chambers of our parliament. <laughs> if you want to refine that slightly, do, uh, Darkesh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, let, let me restate the question. Would you uh, consider running for uh, aspiring towards a leadership position in the UK, uh, g given how successful past historians have been at, <laughs> at that endeavor? Um, well, I, we, we've just mentioned one past historian who's been successful. I assure you that there are an awful lot of <laughs> other ones who haven't. No, I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy with the extent that I uh, involve myself in in politics in the UK. I I got to get back down to writing history books. Frankly, is the uh, is the um, reason I was I was put on earth really. Now uh, tying back Churchill and your your most recent book, th there's this interesting thing where wartime leaders, very successful wartime leaders, are kicked out of office after they they win their wars. Churchill in 1945. Uh, De Gaulle resigns in '46. He led the the French against the Nazis, and then more recently, in the in, which you discuss in your book, you know George H. W. Bush uh, possibly has the most successful foreign policy since World War II: uh, the unification of Germany, the fall of the Soviet bloc without a single shot being fired, and, and many others. But oh, David Lloyd George is the other um, classic example, of course. You know, David Lloyd George led us to victory in the First World War. He was he was out by 1922. So what is this? Why, why are we why are we in democratic countries uh, keen to kick out the people who win us these uh, these wars and foreign policy wins? Because we recognise that the skills you need in peace are completely different from the ones you need in war, and um, what the Labour Party was offering in 1945, uh, for example, this sort of New Jerusalem of um, of socialism and the welfare state and nationalising the Bank of England and uh, free stuff, essentially, um, National Health Service, um, was um, going to be given by Clement Attlee. But um, 
although much of that actually was going to be done by Winston Churchill as well, they recognised that the Conservatives didn't have their heart in it in the same way that the Socialists did. So it's completely rational, isn't it, in a democratic country to go for, when you've got a choice of leaders, to go for the one who's going to... um, lead you through the peace, it, however well the person who led you through the war um, did. Although those particular exam- uh, that particular example of, uh, of socialism in Britain doesn't seem like the, the rational choice for the British population to have made. Well, it did after six years of gruelling warfare, where people wanted um, to have a, a sort of more healthy and better life. And they assumed that socialism was going to be able to do that it, uh, for them. It took us half a century before we grew out of that particular uh, Miasma. Now let's talk about future wars, which is um, something interesting that you and uh, General Petrae survey in your most recent book. You mentioned that the def- uh, the balance of power has shifted more towards defense than offense uh, recently. Well, why why is that? And we're seeing that, aren't we? Or we will be about to see that, I fear, in uh, Gaza. Um, that uh, in in Napoleonic times, it was one in three. You needed three attackers for every defender. In the uh, that's probably stays true until the Second World War. But um, frankly, with uh, I mean, taking Gaza as a as a indication, you know, with IEDs, uh, with booby traps, with um, certainly with all these tunnels, and with uh, the capacity for ambush. It's uh, and for, uh, for sniper fire as well, which has uh, has come on le- leaps and bounds since the old days of Stalingrad. You need uh, you need more than certainly more than three to uh, to one in offence. It's a um, it's a um, interesting fact, you know, that uh, that when Clausewitz was uh, was writing, three to one was a was a perfectly uh, reasonable uh, ratio. But I think that's gone. Um, gone to the birds now. Oh, interesting. This just preempted and I guess answered a question I was about to ask you, which is, it was, it's remarkable to me that the three to one ratio, which Clausewitz first came up with, has uh, stayed consistent for, I, I guess the answer is that it hasn't. But I was about to ask, well, it's weird that for hundreds of years with all these new technologies, that that, that ratio is still the one that people use, uh, that tacticians still use. Yes. Well, they, they, as I say, they did until until sort of well into our lifetimes. But they'd be mad to uh, today because um, because that has altered, especially, of course, in um, built up areas, in the in the kind of um, situation which one gets in um, in Gaza with lots of um, high rise buildings, fewer now than there were, uh, to be frank, but uh, um, lots of um, of built up areas. You can look at, for example, um, the Battle of Monte Cassino, where because the Allies flattened the, um, the whole, the monastery, um, actually, the rubble was more easy for the Germans to defend with um, machine gun nests and and so on than if the actual uh, building had been left standing. So there is an argument actually that you do better if you don't um, blast the uh, blast the buildings, and as you saw also in Mariupol, which you mentioned earlier, and um, and then there's of course Stalingrad, where they fight something called Rats Creek, which is essentially rats war, because people are, are fighting down in the cellars. Um, you know, it's hand to hand stuff. It's extremely vicious where every building, every room um, has to be fought sometimes down with, with bayonets. So um, this kind of fighting, which of course is heavily, heavily uh, full of um, high casualty rates, might well be the one that we're about to um, to see the IDF um, enter in Gaza. That's a scary comparison. The Gaza becomes Stalingrad. I, I didn't think of it that way, but that's wow. In my um, in my um, house in uh, in London, I have an actual copy of one of Winston Churchill's speeches with his handwritten annotations, and one of the sentences um, is that London, fought street by street, could engulf and devour. An entire hostile army, and um, one hopes that it doesn't happen. Obviously, to the um, IDF, but uh, you know that's the that's the reality of um, house to house fighting. I, actually, while we're on the subject, I, I have a few other questions about World War II that I want to ask you before we return to future wars. You know, you have this really interesting book. I, I think probably my favorite book about World War II, uh, "The Storms of War," which I highly recommend. And in it, 
um, in it, you make the claim, uh, <laughs> you make the claim that we're not for the ideologically inspired blunders of Hitler and the Nazis, that they could have won World War II. And then you detail a lot of the mistakes they made. But when we step back and look at, after America joins the war, the overwhelming out industrial output of America, even if they didn't make these mistakes, is there really any chance that, uh, you know, you have a country that has like 2x the GNP and is outproducing the rest of the world combined ships and planes that you could have really stood up to that? Well, why did Hitler um, declare war against America? There, there wouldn't have been a war if he hadn't declared war against America. You'd have fought a war against the country that um, attacked you, Japan. And so, um, and the reason is uh, because he was a Nazi, because he believed that uh, Jews and blacks dominated the um, American decision-making process, which, by the way, is completely absurd. When one looks at the Roosevelt administration, um, it had it had very, very few Jews or blacks. Um, but nonetheless, the uh, the Nazis didn't sort of um, uh, do their their factual um, accuracy it wasn't it wasn't always their highest uh, um, attribute and um, they also thought that Americans uh, were cowards and wouldn't be able to fight very well which is extraordinary considering that uh, the Americans had fought very well indeed in the first world war they um, Adolf Hitler told Molotov when they were in a um, in a bunker in 1940 in Berlin, that the Americans wouldn't, if the Americans did come into the war, they wouldn't be able to actually um, put any troops into um, the Western theatre until the year 1970. Um, as it was needless to say, by November 1942, you had a quarter of a million GIs storming ashore in North Africa. Um, so, so this uh, this sense of ideology. You see it also, of course, six months earlier in the June of 1941, where um, Hitler invades Russia in the belief that the Slavic people can't stand up to the to the great um, German Aryan uh, master race, and is he, as Goebbels said to him, will kick in the door and the whole rotten edifice will come crashing down. Talking about the Bolshevik state. But um, but that's not what happened, of course, and uh, and the Russians fighting on their own territory, i.e., when they're not fighting an adventure, a foreign adventure like in Poland or in um, Finland or now in Ukraine, are actually very good um, soldiers. So uh, he got that wrong again and again. Um, Hitler put his Nazi ideology before the strategic best interests of the um, of the German Reich. It was fascinating to read the different mistakes that they're made, um, obviously from liquidating six million of his most productive, intelligent and well-educated uh, people um, to the timing of Operation Barbarossa or launching it in the first place um, to the timing of launching World War II in the first place. But e even if he hadn't declared war on America, the uh, the lend lease aid on whose basis the Soviets were able to drive back uh, the Germans would still have continued. Uh, and that was, of course, a meat grinder where the overwhelming majority of German troops died. Uh, so it, I, I guess you could say, well, then, then he wouldn't have done Operation Barbarossa at all. Uh, but then are, are we still talking about the same war? He would have invaded uh, Russia and be caught on, on in this enormous uh, war. And uh, But if he hadn't declared war on the United States, it's very difficult to work out how Roosevelt would have been able to have declared war on him, especially if you're fighting a full-scale war against uh, Japan, which by that stage, had uh, by early 1942, covered one-eighth of the um, world's surface. It's a it's a it's a huge undertaking, um, but by by the calendar year nineteen, you're absolutely right about the might of American production. By the calendar year nineteen forty four, when the British produced twenty eight thousand warplanes, the Russians and the Germans both produced forty thousand each. The United States produced ninety eight thousand warplanes. It's almost as much as the whole of the rest of the world put together. You know, they were building Liberty ships at the rate of one a week. It was just truly extraordinary um, uh, thing in terms of just sheer production. So of course that was going to give them the um, the final say over who commanded at D-Day, you know, when D-Day would happen um, and uh, what would happen once they landed um, in, uh, in France. 
uh, but it also had huge implications for um, for everything else really in the Second World War as well. And you're also completely right to say for every five Germans killed in conflict, I by I don't mean bombed from the air, I mean killed on a battlefield, four of them died on the Eastern Front. Now, uh, given how misled Hitler was by Nazi ideology, why weren't the Soviets as misled by communist ideology in the waging of World War II? Because um, communist ideology hadn't uh, affected actual um, Politburo, the way in which the Politburo worked under Stalin. Um, there was no sort of dictatorship of the, of the proletariat or uh, or anything uh, like that, uh, let alone any equality. Um, he, he was a obviously a totalitarian dictator, but what he did learn was um, that the Hitlerian way of fighting the war um, was not the most productive one. So what you get after Operation Barbarossa, in which after which he had some kind of a mini mental breakdown in the immediate hours that he learned about it, how the one man he trusted in politics, Adolf Hitler, had betrayed him. For a paranoid, you know, that's a that's a difficult uh, moment uh, for, to take. But then what he does is to start to lean on those um, marshals, such as Konyev and and uh, Zhukov and Rokosovsky and others, and um, and gives them a lot more power than they ever had before, and listens to them and uh, takes their advice, and actually um, has a a much more kind of Western view, um, Western, the relationship between Churchill, Roosevelt, um, Alan Brooke and George Marshall, which I write about in my book, Masters and Commanders, um, is a uh, is a, a, a big sort of give and take, um, a much more sort of democratic and Western way of, um, of coming to military decisions. And that's the one that Stalin adopts, and quite rightly, and completely contrasted from what's going on in the Wolfschanze, 18 miles behind the, uh, 1800 miles behind the German front, which is uh, actually the, the Fuhrer listening sometimes for hours to his generals, most of whom know strategy far better than he because uh, they actually went to staff colleges. And um, they fought, of course, as officers in the First World War rather than just as a corporal. And um, men like uh, Rundstedt and uh, Guderian and Manstein and so on, these uh, these people would be listened to by um, by Hitler. And then right at the end of the meeting, um, Hitler would sum up and uh, and say that they were going to do exactly what he'd originally said right at the beginning of the meeting, and we have the we have um, the every word said by everybody at the Führer uh, conferences because the stenographers you know took down every word that was said, and it's very clear that they would go into tremendous detail, um, but ultimately the the Führer was the um, his way was the way that um, the Wehrmacht went. This is actually interesting, and this is one of the points you discuss in conflict about you, you talk about the different ways in which democracies, which are dictatorships, are able to execute wars. And World War II is obviously the the perfect example to evaluate this. Well, except for the Soviet Union was not a democracy, of course, and it was on the winning side. You know, there there is that sort of glaring uh, glaring glitch in the argument. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, fair enough. Um, but so you know, you have the Allied, um, the the Western democracies have this strategy by committee. I think you described it in, in the in Storms of War, and um, that that obviously means that you know something as stupid as Operation Barbarossa never happens. You have to come to consensus between all these uh, leaders. Um, at the same time, in your Napoleon biography, uh, you have this singular genius who is able to execute these moves that uh, even his advisors uh, and, and often are like, well, you shouldn't do that. I guess in the case of Russia, they were right. But yeah, so this um, maybe just you can talk generally about the the merits of strategy by consensus versus strategy by a singular uh, mind. Yes. I, actually, the interesting thing about Napoleon in 1812 is that he wasn't warned by his uh, generals that it was a big mistake. What he, and this was partly because he and they thought that this was going to be a three-week campaign 
and it was only going to go about 50 miles into Russian territory before the Russians capitulated or came to a big battle and were defeated. And he had absolutely no plans at all to go all the way to Moscow uh, in 1812. That would, have, um, that would have seemed, as he was crossing the uh, Neiman River, as um, a complete absurdity. But he was drawn in more and more into the Russian uh, heartland until, until finally um, they gave... Um, battle in September 1812 at uh, Borodino, and um, and then he he went on and and took Moscow, but he left enough time to get back from uh, Moscow to um, uh, Smolensk. Um, it was, uh, in fact, more time than he had taken to get from Smolensk to to Moscow. There are other reasons which I go into in the book. Um, about why the retreat from Moscow turned into the catastrophe it did, but it wasn't actually primarily the um, the weather at the beginning, at least. So, um, so yes, Napoleon is the classic example of the single mind uh, strategic uh, leader who, um, like I don't know Alexander the Great or, or Julius Caesar, has the um, has the whole centrality of the um, of the campaign in his head, essentially. But of course, he does lose, <laughs> and, uh, and after eighteen twelve, you have the um, the various coalitions of eighteen thirteen and eighteen fourteen, which force him to abdicate. Then he comes back, of course, in the hundred days and loses there as well. So um, that is um, by um, uh, in, in contrast to the much more collegiate way that uh, Wellington and Schwarzenberg and Blücher and so on interacted with uh, with one another but yes your 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 overall thesis i think is um is is absolutely right about democracies being better at fighting wars but dictatorships of course and totalitarian uh, ones are authoritarian as well are much better at starting wars because they do have the element of surprise very often one looks at the Yom Kippur War, of course, you look at 9-11, at uh, Pearl Harbor, Barbarossa that you mentioned earlier, the Falklands, the um, attack on um, on Kuwait by Saddam. You know, there's, there's a great line of... The Chinese sneaking into Korea. <clears throat> It's not the, 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 the Chinese crossing the Yalu, absolutely uh, Yalu River, 160,000 of them in the, at the dead of night. I mean, it's the most extraordinary surprise attack. And there's that wonderful line of Paul Wolfowitz's who, uh, when he said that um, surprise uh, attacks take place so often in uh, history that the only surprising thing is that we're still surprised by them. Um, and, uh, and and that is right. Um, democracies can do surprise attacks. Obviously, the, the major exception to that rule is when, um, is when Israel did successfully carry out the uh, Six-Day War surprise attack at the beginning of that, um, of that conflict. But otherwise, democracies tend not to. And by the way, it's a good thing not to, because what it does do is light a fire under the uh, country that's been surprised classic examples of course being pearl harbor and makes them feel outraged and and uh, uh, and angry and as a result they um uh, they tend to extract uh, revenge and uh, by the way hamas what hamas uh, did on the 7th of october is a classic example of that of course that's a surprise attack which was uh, by its own light immensely successful but which uh, will have um have lit a fire under Israel that um, is going to uh, is going to be very dangerous for Hamas. This is actually an excellent opportunity to ask you about uh, bring us back to the future of war, which you discuss in your newest book, Conflict. Uh, the question I have is, given you discuss in the book, um, we have you know the satellite reconnaissance and drones and all this cyber espionage. Given how clearly we can see the world now, with these new technologies are large scale surprise attacks ever going to be possible again? That's a very good question. I, I, I'm tempted to say no, because you're quite right. Uh, thing, everything can be spotted on the, um, on the battlefield today. Obviously, the Hamas surprise attack uh, was a much, much smaller scale than a, a complete um, you know, nation-on-nation kind of attack like Barbarossa or uh, Pearl Harbor. But nonetheless, um, it is much more difficult to hide, hide troops um, today than it um, ever has been in the past. 
that doesn't change, of course, the psychology of what happens when you are surprised in the way that uh, Israel was. But um, yeah, the we've in the tenth chapter, the last chapter of our book, we call it uh, the future of war. We look at uh, areas like cyber and space, but also sensors, uh, AI, robotics, and drones. Of course, you know, in the future, the uh, war will be fought between two sets of drones, and the humans won't be in the loop. They'll be on the loop. They'll have written the algorithms, but of course, but they won't be. Um, uh, in the loop because decision making has to take place far, far faster than the human mind can work. When, uh, if, if a human is, um, is involved and at the controls of, uh, weaponry of the future, then he'll lose. It has to be fought between, um, between two sets of machines. And of course, that has great advantages in terms of speed, but also, um, machines have no conscience. They don't feel fear or cowardice, they don't feel remorse or regret or pity, um, it's going to be a much more um, dangerous world in that sense. Yeah, and that has all kinds of interesting implications. You, uh, all f From the technical, which you discuss in the book, that the electromagnetic spectrum will be under much greater contention because then you can jam the electronics and the communications between these devices. To the strategic, I mean, you have these examples, I, famously, like, let's say that in the 1980s, when the stock market crashes, because uh, an algorithm malfunctions, if that leads to a world war, the, the, whatever that was, the equivalent of that leads to a world war. So what you discuss in your Ukraine chapter, that, you know, the tech entrepreneurs are now having uh, a bit much bigger impact on the, uh, on the waging of war, where obviously you have Elon Musk providing Starlink services to Ukraine. And notably, refusing to provide uh, the service uh, to help with the surprise attack, the naval surprise attack that um, uh, Ukraine was planning on launching in Crimea. Now, how will the ability of tech entrepreneurs to dictate where and how they will get involved in the um, in lending their technology to governments? How will that play into the future strategy? Will they be a force for peace? Or will they be not be a force at all? Because if the government really wants your technology, in the end, they can just expropriate it. Um, I don't think they'll they'll do that, except for in times of um, extreme stress, but uh, and crisis. But um, no, actually, there's a there's a very wide and I think overall very positive um, area that uh, that tech entrepreneurs can play here. Um, and uh, Starlink, yes, it's true that Mr. Musk did. Um, refuse to help one attack in Crimea but overall Starlink has been uh, invaluable in this uh, in this war I mean in a way it is the first proper internet war you know people with iPhones on the battlefield can upload um, both images and uh, and obviously also uh, map references which can prove extremely useful to um, drones and uh, and artillery and this is one of the reasons that Kyiv didn't fall in the opening um, parts of the of the Russo-Ukrainian war um, because the uh, because um, Ukrainian artillery was being given um, uh, the accurate information on all sorts of open intelligence um, open sources it's uh, it's it was a new kind of warfare uh, which the Russians took a very long time to uh, catch up with and of course because they didn't have their own um, people on the ground whereas Ukraine did the native population was 100% opposed to um, uh, the Russian invasion in every area apart from four Donbass oblasts. You essentially had um, just a um, you know multitude of information sources that were proving to be incredibly useful. So so that's one aspect of um, of the modernity. The next one obviously is drones and uh, and the use they've been put to um, by the Ukrainians. But um, the the sort of innovative. Uh, stance of the Ukrainians has been really extraordinarily impressive. And when um, tech uh, people all across the world, not just obviously in the United States, um, came out very actively in support of Ukraine, it really did uh, move the dial. And so I think with companies like Panantir 
and others that are, um, are really making huge advances. It's and the cutting edge still being with the um, uh, with the West in terms of uh, uh, tech entrepreneurial ability. Um, this is a good thing for the West, and um, that some individuals are going to be pretty much like Mr. Musk is the um, the most important private individuals I would say to actually affect warfare since um, Thiessen and Krupp. Uh, back in um, before the First World War, so it really is uh, a, a new world. But it's not not a you know, bad new world. It could actually be an extremely good new world for for the West and for democracy. Yeah. Um, speaking of tech entrepreneurs and their personalities, uh, let's discuss your biography of Napoleon. So I'm not aware if you are aware of this, but living in San Francisco, there is um, in the startup community. There is a cult of Napoleon that that is slowly emerging. Is emerged. there? I didn't know that. Seriously, is there? Your biography is a uh, is the part of the canon here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, in in the person of Napoleon, I think startup founders see the the the, mo the best aspects of themselves resemble. You have somebody who is a young upstart, just stupendously energetic and competent much more efficient than the, the bureaucracies and old systems around him, a reformer, uh, tremendously intellectually curious, an autodidact. You can just go down the list. What is your reaction? <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's exactly what, uh, yeah, absolutely. It was, uh, he was totally fascinated by every new thing. Um, he flung himself into, uh, into, you know, ideas for, um, balloons and uh, submarines and anything that could, um, be useful for agricultural, um, development. He was fascinated by trying to build bridges faster and better and, and cheaper. Uh, he was a, um, he was a real, Go getter when it came to uh, giving prizes for new chemical um, components and so on. This was uh, this was somebody who created the Legion d'honneur not just for soldiers, but very much for inventors and and entrepreneurs and people like that who he felt were going to help France um, outstrip Britain essentially, uh, which had a head start on France in the Industrial Revolution. So it was um, so there was a very strong sort of national nationalist um the reasoning behind uh, his embrace of uh, of science but you know he got he was made a um a fellow of the uh, of the french academy on the basis of his genuine interest not just because he was um, the first consul of, of france and he used to attend all their meetings you know and this was a, an extraordinary thing if there was going to be a meeting on i don't know electricity um sitting in the front there would be the first consul um uh, taking notes so i can understand why uh why young tech uh um entrepreneurs might might uh, like Napoleon, and I'm thrilled that my book might be helping with that. Yeah, no, I, I think you'd be surprised uh, to the, the extent of it. The, uh, it. Also, it's true that megalomaniacs also love Napoleon. Um, so <laughs> I, I'm not saying that there is a massive, um, you know, Venn diagram shaded area between tech entrepreneurs and megalomaniacs, but uh, it doesn't necessarily, you know, you're, liking Napoleon doesn't necessarily mean that you're uh, um, going to be a great tech entrepreneur, shall we say. <laughs> Mm. On the point of being a, a futurist, it's really remarkable in your Churchill biography you discuss the ways in which he for, saw the um, the influence of tanks and planes and even nuclear energy far before uh, many others. His best friend was the Oxford um, professor for physics, uh, Professor Lindemann, and uh, later Lord Charwell. He was a, um, I mean, when it comes to the people that he had around him, he loved um, having scientists around him. He said that scientists should be um, uh, on tap, but not on top. Uh, so he did recognize that, you know, he didn't want to have a sort of uh, world run by scientists, but he definitely wanted to know what they were thinking. And as early as the 19, mid-1920s, 
Uh, so a good uh, 20 years before the um, atom bomb, he talked about how an entire city could be destroyed by a, by a nuclear bomb the size of an orange. And, you know, that was very advanced stuff, frankly. Um, he, uh, he, of course, was fascinated by the use of radar in the Second World War, especially at the very beginning of the Second World War, how one could bend the German rays to mean that their bombers were sent off target and, and didn't fly over British cities. He wanted to get into the real nitty gritty of all of that. And of course, the um, the ultimate um, sort of mathematical genius machine, um, the um, the Enigma, um, the ultra machine that, that broke the uh, Enigma code. So, um, so in everything to do with that, uh, he was also really interested in sort of learning and understanding the reasoning behind what was going on. Uh, it's um, it's a because I mean, it's very easy to think of Churchill as a bit of a reactionary figure, this sort of tubby Tory uh, with his cigars and his brandy and wanting to hang on to India and all of these sort of um, very much sort of set in the past kind of attitudes and uh, attributes. But really, uh, he was somebody who was obsessed with the future. But on the point of uh, Napoleon, it's it, you know it's interesting the the way you describe the way he would micromanage every aspect of the empire it, and obviously his energy and efficiency. It's it reads honestly like an Elon Musk biography uh, where you know Elon is micromanaging the engines on his Raptors at the same time running these five other companies. Uh, I, I wonder what you think a person like Napoleon does today. If, if the that 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 seems that a genes is born today, does he become an Elon Musk or does he do something else? No, that's that? exactly what he. Of course, he does. Absolutely, he 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 goes to Silicon Valley and sets up his own company and uh, makes a billion out of um, finding something useful to uh, to advance mankind with. That's exactly what Napoleon does today. And uh, and by the way, um, if he has anything like the same uh, acquisitive tech techniques, he probably um, buys up lots of other um, companies around him in the way that Napoleon invaded country after country. But when he did invade those countries, what he would do, for example, in, in Italy after the Italian campaign, uh, and he entered uh, Milan, the first thing he did was to get together the um, Milanese uh, intellectuals, the writers, the scientists, the chemists, and so on. Uh, he was very interested in astronomy and uh, um, and so on, and would um, and would talk to them about about their thing. So you had an intellectual as leader, which frankly the Bourbons for the last thousand years of French history is very difficult to think of of more than one or two genuine intellectuals um, uh, as ruler. And so one can understand why he became popular amongst the. Uh, uh, amongst the middle class and the intellectuals themselves. And he would also, one of the other things he would do was to go into every town he went into, he would go into the ghetto and free the Jews and give them uh, civil and religious rights and so on. Uh, and I think that was tremendously forward thinking for that day and age as well, and a very attractive feature about him. You know, obviously the biography of Napoleon, um, I must say tragically, and I notice this about many other biographies of great people I read is often what makes them great in the first place is they keep making these double or nothing gambles that, you know, catapult them to to the top. And then, of course, at some point your luck runs out. Uh, that's obviously an oversimplification in, the, in, in every single case. But I wonder if this is also a pattern you notice in the lives of great figures. I, you could say for Elon, the, the, the having his uh, reputation and fortune wasted away at the author of Twitter could be an example of one such thing, but what is your reaction to that? Yes, of course, um, hubris is the occupational hazard of, um, of hugely successful people, needless to say. I mean, it's probably also the occupational hazard of lots of other people, but we just don't know about it because they're not hugely successful. Um, but um, one, one does tend to get uh, stuck in one's ways. One can't necessarily, you know, old dog, new tricks. Uh, you can't necessarily... Um, reinvent yourself and um, and therefore you go down the, the same old paths. I would say in Napoleon's defense, of course, not least that idea that when he invaded eight, in 1812, which is the key moment, you know, after that, nothing good happens. 
that and before that lots and lots of good things happen um but the key thing about that is that look he had beaten the russians twice before he was inv invading with an army of 615,000 which was the same size as paris at that time he um didn't he knew that the uh, russian army was only about half the size of his and he um didn't want to go too far into Russia, which of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, changed in the course of the campaign. But it wasn't an insane, hubristic, mad decision to uh, to go to war against Russia in 1812. What was hubristic, mad and insane was to try to beat Britain by imposing a continental blockade on the entirety of Europe and therefore attempting to sort of crush Britain by stopping um, smuggling which was completely rife and to stop every other country from entering into um, free trade with um, with Britain. It was that belief in that protectionism could somehow win the war against Britain. That was the mad thing. And that's what led him into the Peninsula campaign, which cost him a quarter of a million soldiers. Wow. Oh, actually, so it, it's, you ha if you have somebody like Napoleon, who for his entire life has succeeded in who is at the t the tail end of multiple bell curves, succeeded in ways that nobody could have, nobody else is uh, succeeding or could anticipate, or people tell him, well, that's that's not possible, and he accomplishes it. Obviously, he has to take, you know, advisors with a grain of salt, knowing that he has been able to do things that others have not been able to do. But he also has to recognize his limits. And this is not just a question of Napoleon in particular, but just in general, how do, how does somebody who is at the tail end of multiple distributions? not fall back to mediocrity when making judgments about themselves, but also recognize their limits. It's, it's, it's always a question of um, choosing the right advisors, isn't it? In domestic politics, areas that he d knew he didn't know that much about, uh, legal codes and so on. He, um, although it's called the Napoleonic Code, actually, of course, it was his legal experts who, who drew it up and saw it through and, and uh, passed the legislation and so on. And so areas that he wasn't particularly interested in, he did allow a considerable degree to um, to be um, decided by, not decided by. No, that's one stage. That's one stage too far. But advised upon, he would be. To, he he was the dictator. He had the ultimate decision. But um, he was very good at choosing um, advisors, um, quite regardless of of what their status were in in society. You know. Um, or quite how, how respectable they were. There's a man called Cambassière who was a truly powerful figure and he was gay. And this was something that was pretty much unknown at that stage. He was outwardly uh, gay and at a time when, of course, that was against the law. But Napoleon didn't mind that because he was so good at his job um, that, he, um, that he kept him on as Arch-Chancellor. Some of the uh, marshals, he was a true believer in meritocracy and that some of his marshals, there were 26 marshals, 13 of them came from the working classes and in some cases below. They were, they were um, peasants, they were the sons of innkeepers and uh, barrel coopers and uh, domestic servants and so on. And, um, and yet if he saw that a man was, uh, was lucky was one of the things he always wanted in his generals but also uh was a natural leader uh he would um he would appoint him and they became marshals and all the marshals apart from a couple became dukes and princes uh two of them became kings you know to to, to be the son of a barrel cooper and to become a king in the um, early 19th century was a truly extraordinary thing in an army where um for the last um a uh, thousand years, certainly, your rank and status in life was very much the same as your father and grandfather. Uh, one thing I found really interesting in your biographies of Napoleon and Churchill, if I'm remembering correctly, both of them wrote a novel in their early 20s or thereabouts where they save their country in battle, or not they, a character saves their country in battle and wins over a pretty maiden. And 
Um, I, I remember the little details, but I, I thought, that, wow, both of them did that. That's that's a really interesting detail. What, what explains this? Um, yes, it, it's probably a, a terrible psychological uh, disorder. But I've just realised that I did the same thing when I was in my twenties. <laughs> uh, I had a, a novel in which I I saved the country and 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 married the fair maiden. Um, gosh, I don't know what that makes me. Probably a megalomaniac like uh, like Napoleon. But um, yes, it's they, they're they're both great um reads by the way i love uh, clisson and eugenie the uh, the book you're referring to by napoleon but the best one by far is savarola uh, by winston churchill where you see lots of of rolling churchillian phrases which come out again and again later on in uh, in life and you're right I and mean, both of them they're very very obviously autobiographical and um and the hero actually in savarola the hero doesn't he saves the country, but then he goes off into exile. And um, but uh, with and, and I think doesn't uh, the Napoleon figure uh, die heroically in battle after saving the nation? But there's a lot of nation saving going on in both of those uh, um, youthful novels. Now that we're nearing the end of our time, I, I want to ask you about um, how is it possible. You're in the House of Lords. I just realized that. Uh, well, I knew you were in the House of Lords, but I just realized how much of your time that consumes. On top of that, you're writing these uh, books that are, you know, your biographies are widely recognized as the best biographies of these people who are, have thousands of biographies written about them. Uh, and you're doing, you've written 20 books, you're in the house. How are you managing your time? How is this possible? <laughs> um, because I start um, work at 4 a.m. every day. Um, you get five hours or so before anyone wants to bother you or, um, or you know, uh, irritate you. <laughs> and so that's the, that's the trick. It's time management. I have a, um, a nap every single day for about half an hour in the afternoon. Uh, I've been doing it since I was at Cambridge 40 years ago. Um, and so I've trained my, my body to, to switch off and then switch back on again. And um, it means that you get two days, essentially, you know, uh, of uh, work out of out of one day on earth. So it's, uh, I mean, obviously, everybody's body clock is completely different. But I do um, recommend if you're, if you're young enough to start, and as I say, I started when I was in my early 20s, uh, you can, um, you can can really squeeze more time out of the day than you think is uh, mathematically possible. Yeah, I'm 23, so this might be a perfect time to launch this habit. It's the, today's the day. Make sure after lunch you you put on an eye patch and and literally go to bed, and uh, and um, you will find that you've you've squeezed an extra day out of uh, out of the day. So why is biography, which is a genre you've employed across many of your books? And of course, books that have become overwhelmingly famous, uh, rightly so. Why is that the best medium to understand an era or to understand that impact of the era on the present? Because it focuses the mind, concentrates the mind on one person. You emotionally uh, connect with that person. You either love him or hate him or her. Of course, uh, I have done some um, some work on, on writing about women. It's the great man and woman theory of history, of course. And I do believe in that because I think that although, of course, there are enormous uh, historical movements that happen you know the uh, decline of magic and the rise of science and so on the uh, uh, industrialization and everything those come about as the result of the uh, deliberate choices made by millions indeed billions of people and um, and you can't uh, look at something like the invasion of russia we were talking about earlier in 1812 or um, or Churchill's decision to fight on and not make peace with Hitler in 1940 and not recognize that the individual does play an absolutely central role in uh, in some major world changing decisions so um, I think it is intellectually justified to write biography a lot of Whigs and determinists and Marxists don't they they think that uh, that biography is a um, uh, is far too um, anti-determinist, but in fact, um, you know, what are we but our decisions? Man is spirit, as, as uh, Churchill said, and um, so I think it it stacks up as a uh, as a reasonable way for me to spend my time. 
Yeah, indeed. I think that's a great place to close this conversation. This was absolutely fascinating. Uh, and the book, again, uh, it, I highly recommend it. It, it was a, a really thorough and interesting and uh, read about recent conflicts with insights from not only the one of the best historians in the world, but also somebody who commanded the, the two most uh, recent um, campaigns that are uh, that involved uh, conflict since World War II. So the book is Conflict, the Evolution of Warfare from 1945 to Ukraine, available at uh, Amazon and fine bookstores everywhere. Andrew, thank you so much. Thank you, Dwokesh. I really enjoyed it. Hey, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that episode. As always, the most helpful thing you can do is to share the podcast. Send it to people you think might enjoy it. Put it in Twitter, your group chats, etc. Just blitz the world. Appreciate you listening. I'll see you next time. Cheers.